much of the book, once you get into the first, past the first few chapters, the, the core of the book, if you will, records lengthy conversation between Job's infamous friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. Uh, each of these three friends, I guess we could call them friends, they, they, they show up after all this calamity has happened to him and Job is sitting there in the dust, uh, you know, dying with boils and, you know, horrible disease all over his body and everything. And they show up and they don't even speak for seven days, uh, which shows that they were somewhat spiritually uh, sensitive because there's not much you can say. But they were with him for seven days and then finally one of them speaks. And then all three of them speak, and then Job speaks back to them, and there's a conversation that goes back and forth. But each of these guys is going to dig into Job and rebuke him. They're going to excoriate Job for doing something horrible to deserve such intense suffering. But the whole book, we will see, exonerates Job. Job is frustrated. He's full of despair. But in the end, he remains faithful, and he remains repentant. Um, he wants a hearing with God. But in the end, he, he knows that, uh, that, that you know, God is supreme, God is powerful, and God is just. And so uh, these three guys, it's, it's as if this is one last thing that Job suffers, and that he doesn't even get comfort from his wife, who told him to curse God and die. He doesn't get comfort from his friends. Okay. And then uh, right about two-thirds of the way through the book, Elihu, uh, another man shows up. He's a, he's a younger man. He has not spoken because he let the older men speak first. But eventually he jumps in and decides to, you know, set the story straight. So he interrupts the discussion and he sharply re rebukes both Job and all of the three friends. And he goes on extensively for several books there, for several chapters, and he opines extensively in setting forth all kinds of views, but he really offers no comfort. And at the end, he says nothing really much different from the three friends, okay, from Elihu and Zophar and Bildad. Um, now, what are these, all these guys saying? Um, they're basically saying that, look, if you're suffering intensely, you must have done something bad, okay? Because there is a kind of a law of retribution that goes on. Uh, you know, it's, it, it's this idea of, well, you know, if, you, if you're suffering, you must have done something bad. You know, you reap what you sow. Or to put it in other terms, it's kind of what some religious traditions might call karma. If something bad's happened to you, it's because you did something bad to deserve it. Okay? And so uh, this whole book is going to be written, I think, to show that that's not the case. Not always, anyway. Okay. Now, towards the end of the book, God will then jump in. God will finally respond, and He will rebuke Elihu. Some people think He's rebuking Job, uh, but He's going to rebuke Elihu for darkening counsel, and then He's going to rebuke the three friends for their ignorance because they're wrong. Okay. Now, Job's existential crisis will end with him pleading before God for reasons for his acute suffering. And God is going to reply to Job that he's a mere powerless man, he's not God, and that he cannot grasp the purposes of God. God will finally reward Job by doubly restoring everything he lost, including his health, and give him a new family. And restore, again, all of his wealth, all of his lost flocks and so forth, tens of thousands of, uh, of herds of cattle. Okay? So Job is going to remain faultless throughout. He had lost heart and questioned God. But in the end, he remains sinless. Job's friends are going to had vehemently insisted that he must have sinned severely to deserve the loss of such vast property, his children. But yet Job remained maintained in front of his friends that he was innocent, that he had done nothing wrong. And yet they charged him of hubris for even saying such things. So Job's claims of innocence proved to Eliphaz, for example, that he was a sinner. This pride, this hubris, this denial, and this stubbornness to even admit that you've done something wrong, well, that's sin right there in, a, in itself, okay, that you are so prideful. And so, like Job's friends, many people today will assume that all suffering is well-deserved, that somehow or another we've done something wrong to deserve such a thing. And so, um, Job shows that the, the book of Job shows that this is an inaccurate assumption. It is only true sometimes. 
Yes, generally people reap what they sow. And this ancient doctrine of retribution holds that one gets what one deserves, kind of reward or punishment. And so we look at someone who's doing really well and you know, they just have everything going for them in life and we think, well, they, you know, they must be living right. You know, they must, uh, you know, God is rewarding them. Okay? Or we look at someone who's doing very poorly and has suffered all kinds of calamities and so forth and we must think, well, they must be sinful. So uh, this book shows that that is not always the case. Now, Scripture does attest to this idea that we reap what we sow, okay? Uh, but it doesn't, it's not like it's an absolute thing that always must be the case. In other words, you can do very poorly uh, and have all kinds of calamity and yet be sinless, as Job was, okay? Um, so, like I said, some religions kind of call this principle of retribution karma, or that's what people might call it in common language and common parlance. Now, Job's three friends reason that God manifests only a just wrath by inflicting suffering. So Job received a massive punishment, so go figure the heavy weight of his sins. Severe penalty necessitates severe sin. And so I think that the whole book of Job is going to upend, if you will, this narrow-minded retribution doctrine. So we will see even in other places in the Bible, for example, that suffering sometimes occurs to promote deep wisdom. Uh, and we also see that sometimes it's there to glorify God through a deeper faith. Okay? People go through persecution, and persecution can entail all the way down to death. I mean, look what happened to Stephen. He was stoned to death. Look, you know, look what happened to Paul and many, many other people. And yet they were sinless. Okay? So suffering doesn't necessarily mean that you sinned. So one insight should be clear here. That is, that we can't rush to judgment and blame someone who suffers as somehow or another guilty of a great sin.